Um, all I'm going to see is the, uh, the PowerPoint. Yeah. And now we're, and yeah, now I have it up here. So this is hearing aids for beginners and, and a special welcome to all of those who are joining us for the first time. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about me. You see my name. ABD stands for all but dissertation. I was a PhD student at Syracuse. And trying to toggle down and I'm not having much luck with it. Right this way. Okay, here you go. Uh, this is a program of the Rochester chapter of the Hearing Loss Association of America. And you can reach us, and of course you already have, at hearinglossrochester.org. Just a, just a quickie, Joe. I don't see your shared screen. Yeah. So you might want to go down to the share screen. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can do that. That is important, isn't it? Um, Zoom. Shared screen. And there may be additional questions. Yeah, okay. Now I'm trying to call it up. All right, now All right, something. we're in a better spot. Yeah, that's for better. That's great. Yeah, that's definitely going to work better for us. Okay. So now I'll see if I can get to my. I got to move this bar here. There you go. So there's always some little snags when you begin with stuff. And. Uh, so now I, I think I need to back up a bit here. One of the snags I have is I can't find my markers. Here we are. So uh, this, this program is one of several programs of this chapter for people with hearing loss. And um, other programs or, or features of our uh, association, our chapter, include a high quality and well-maintained site, which of course, here's a, here's a little um, ad, includes membership information. And we have our monthly educational informational sessions. And I really think they're really kind of special. We have uh, a local uh, speakers who are on a variety of different topics of interest. Probably the most popular one would be the uh, Ask the Audiologist sections. And this is a great one. So this gives you a chance to ask audiologists who are engaged in private practice any questions you might have about hearing loss or hearing aids. We have our monthly HOPE sessions. And uh, this is, stands for Hearing Other People's Experiences. This is always on the second Tuesday of the month. And it's a chance for people with hearing loss to share their experiences with their hearing loss and hearing aids with other people in an informal group discussion moderated by me. We have a demonstration center of various assistive devices, which is held on the third Thursday of the month. And this is for people with advanced hearing loss who need more than hearing aids. Right now it's operating virtually and we have several of the members with us today who are from this, this program. We have an annual featured speaker program. And th these are presentations by individuals of national prominence who have expertise in relation to hearing hearing loss and hearing aids and related matters. We have a cochlear implant group, which meets quarterly. And this is primarily for people who already have cochlear implants or who might be interested in learning more about them. We have a, a terrific monthly newsletter. And here's my little sales pitch. It only costs you $10 a year and you get a lot of benefits along with that. So just food for thought. Now, each of these sessions are gonna be scheduled for about one and a half hours longer if we have a lot of questions. 
And we're going to provide, we think, important information about things you need to know about getting hearing aids and how to evaluate how you're doing with them. These sessions, as you know, are recorded, but only up to the, the question and answers, which are not recorded for reasons of confidentiality. You can access the sessions through the HLAA chapter website, um, and they are all YouTube uh, presentations. So here's the basic outline of what we're going to be doing. There's going to, in my mind, there's nothing harder to buy than a hearing aid for people. Very high cost. There's virtually no brand recognition. And many times people enter into this with concerns about, is it going to work for me? You hear all these things about hearing aids don't work or they're, they're, they're troublesome, et cetera. So it's a very, very difficult decision for people to make. And actually, I think they need to be quite frustrated with their situation before they move on to thinking about hearing aids. So the purpose of our talks, of course, is to provide individuals with assistance through the very difficult early stages of getting hearing aids. There will be three sessions. The first sessions are uh, important things to know about getting hearing aids. The second one, and even today, will be a little bit on understanding the audiogram. And then the third session is really all about reasonable expectations uh, for new hearing aid users. This is based on experiences of a large number of people in my practice. And we have about 900 results that we, that we tallied over the years on 140 different data points. Here's a little bit about me. I'm a retired audiologist. Uh, as you know, ABD from Syracuse. I was director of audiology at a large community hearing and speech center for about 20 years. I'm a hearing aid user for about 20 years also. And then I had 24 years in private practice as an audiologist. I've had two primary interests professionally in terms of hearing aids. One is hearing aid candidacy. This, this is kind of a complex issue in my mind anyways. Um, and then the other one is, is outcomes. With all of the new technology and all of the claims and all of the procedures, it, it's hard to get the handle on it. And what really matters is not so much the technology, it's how people do with it. So we focused on outcomes in our practice. And the other thing that, that one of my approaches were, um, I, I operated under several assumptions. For some reason, my a PowerPoint's on a timer here. I'm sorry about that. Hearing aids are expensive, as I said. And I wanted to bring down the cost. And you know what? I had two chances to do that. The first one was with the Hearing and Speech Center. We set up one of the very first not-for-profit hearing aid dispensing programs in the country or in the state. I know it's in the state. And um, I thought, boy, you know, we can get rid of all this large margin and everything. Well, it turned out we were not able to do it because of the administrative cost, a larger organization, it was a huge staff. So then I thought, well, maybe when I'm in private practice, I can try it again. And I did, I offered them at a lower price. You know, and it was so low, I almost went out of business. So I had to increase the cost. And I tried the lower cost uh, 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 devices and they just weren't satisfactory to people. So um, that, that proved to me that this is a lot harder to do than if you might initially think. And as we've said, all the other things about the high cost and reputation. And the other thing is that we assumed in our practice is that users don't really know what's normal and what's not normal. So they don't know what to put up with or, or, or is this not right? Or how do I know what to deal with? And if there were problems, my, our assumption was Users don't know what the cause of it is. And you see that all the time. Is it something they're doing? 
Is it their hearing loss? Is it the hearing aid? Is it the way they're fit or set? And they tend not to uh, follow up. And the reason for that is they wonder, are they being too critical? Is it gonna cost me more? Are they being unreasonable? And then there's the human nature aspect. Ah, oh, it's one more thing to deal with. I had to act with it. I'm not going to bother with it now. Um, so as we go on, I have a disclaimer here. It's important to realize the views presented in this discussion pertain only to my practice and the way I chose to implement it. We all know in, in real life, if you ask 10 to 15 different people about any topic for advice, you're likely to get 10 or 15 different approaches to the same question. This is true for hearing aids, of course. There's a lot of different protocols and a lot of different approaches out there. So it's gonna be unlikely that you're gonna find anybody else who agrees with everything that we say. Sometimes people will disagree with most of it. That's not too often the case, but that does happen. As, as we were talking in the earlier discussion, in our practice, because of all the above issues, we opted for active follow-up. That meant that we didn't use the model of, if you're having a problem, call me. We assumed as everybody left the office, they were gonna have a problem. So we either called them and follow up or we anticipated some difficulties and brought them back to make sure these difficulties were resolved. Now, the end, end result was we had a very uncommonly high rate of satisfaction with our outcomes. Let's talk just a little bit about hearing loss. So we kind of get a grounding in this. <clears throat> the most important thing about hearing loss is that it decreases effective listening distance. In the old days, before the advent of the electric audiometer, hearing loss was measured in terms of distance. Normal hearing was the ability to hear a softly spoken voice at a, at a distance of 20 feet in quiet. Then as hearing loss increased, it was necessary for the individual to get closer and closer to the source. So you can see the scale here, normal hearing, zero to 25 dB, and that's, you, that's hearing a soft voice at 20 feet. Mild hearing loss, um, using a regular voice, and the, and the distance is reduced up to 10 feet. Moderate, and the distance is reduced to five feet. Maybe. Severe, three to five feet. And profound, it's a loud voice and right up next to the ear and practically shouting in order for somebody to hear. Deafness is typically defined as 90 to 95 dB or poorer and means no usable hearing for the purpose of communication by speech. So here's a display audiogram. And I think this gives you a pretty good idea of what the normal range of hearing is for somebody with normal hearing. Minus 10, all the way down to 120 decibels. That's 140 decibels, I'm sorry, 130. That's a huge range. Now the thing about decibels is that this is a log scale. So each 10 dB value here is 10 times the previous value. So actually what you're seeing is a tremendous increase in power as you go down the scale. Things get much, much louder. Um, you also see the various display of all of the speech sounds here. Not all of them, the majority of them. Here's the Z and the V, and then the U, E, L. So you can see that there's a lot of Loudness with, these are all the voice sounds and there's a lot of loudness here. Over here are the voiceless sounds, the P, H, G, K, the K, F, S, T, H. They are considerably weaker in loudness and power than are the uh, voice sounds here. The average conversational level, this is a good thing to keep in mind, is 50 decibels. And that's, I'm not talking 50, I'm talking about 55 or 60 right now. But in everyday conversation, it's about 50. So you can hear a dog barking at 70 and the phone ring at maybe 85 and the boss and 
a jet plane, 120, I think probably even more than that. So you see that's quite a range of usable hearing. But if you've got a hearing loss and you get a hearing aid, what it's doing, it's compressing all of that sound into a narrower range. Now, do you think realistically we can get it all into that range? No, we can't. And we lose a lot of this stuff in the low part here, depending upon the degree of hearing loss. But still, there's enough cues left in the louder parts of speech for individuals to be able to fill in the gaps and kind of pick up what they missed. Here's my audiogram. I'm 81, okay? And you can see uh, the highs are down. The zeros, the O's, the circles are for the right. X's are for the left. These triangles are the normative results for a group of individuals 80 to 87 years old in the Netherlands, okay? Which there's no reason to believe that it'd be any different here in America. And it seems to line up. So it just gives you an idea. Most hearing loss is poorest in the high frequencies, better in the lows. I'm very fortunate. I have a really good island of good hearing here at 1,000. And the other thing to look at is these percentage values along the top of the audiogram. The 8%, 14%, 22 33 and 23%. The most important frequency is 2,000 hertz. What that means is that if you were to eliminate all the other frequencies on either side of that and present connected discourse, speech at a good level, loud enough to hear, the individual who's listening would be able to get 33% of the message just based on that band of frequencies alone. So that's critical. And also see that the high frequencies account for half of intelligibility. That's a big deal. So that the lows where all the power is over here, they don't account for much, 8%, 14%. 1,000 you know, is in the middle between them and that's worth 22%. But all the loudness is in this range here, as you can see, for the voice consonants. So that really fools a lot of people because they have almost normal loudness, but they're missing out on the high. They, they don't perceive it because things sound normally loud to them. So, so here's the audiogram. There's only three things at this point you really need to know from the audiogram. First is severity. How far down on the grid are your results? If it's way down, you know you're gonna have a harder time than if it's in the middle. Severity, I'm sorry, configuration. The pattern of the hearing loss, you saw mine. It's down in the highs, good in the lows. That's the standard configuration. Mine's a little worse than usual because of my background and noise and family and stuff. But still, that's the general pattern. Sometimes it goes up like this. Sometimes it's spiky. I call that a sawtooth configuration. That's a tough one to work with, I'll tell you. Word recognition score, this is critical. The word recognition score is a measure of the di distortion in the inner ear. And we'll see later on in the third presentation, exactly a, a very good indication of what that is and what it means. But right now, if word recognition is down, that's a suggestion that there's probably some distortion going on and in the inner ear. And the hearing aids, unfortunately, aren't going to be able to fix that. That's that's beyond what we can do. We can make sounds louder, we can fine tune them, but if your hair cells are missing or severely damaged in the fine tuned aspect of hearing, then we can't really fix that. And you'll see that explained nicely in hopefully in the uh, third uh, uh, presentation here. So these three items can give you a good idea of your prognosis with amplification. If your hearing loss loss slopes sharply, it's gonna be harder. If it's a nice gradual, you're, you're ideal, you're an ideal candidate. If, especially if you're a moderate degree or mild to moderate or even moderately severe. If your word recognition score 
is good, meaning 90 to 100 percent, you're going to be a very good candidate for hearing aid use and benefit. You shouldn't really have any major problems now. It's not always the case, but that's a point for discussion. As I've already said, some configurations make it more difficult to use amplification, sharply falling ones, sawtooth or peat, or very severe, and if word recognition score is down. Now, how do you measure overall severity of hearing loss? We take an average of the critical frequencies for speech. You saw them on that audiogram of mine there, 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000, and average them. That gives you a number, it's an average. And we don't really use percentage of hearing or hearing loss, we use pure tone average, that's the degree. It's an overall indicator of the level of hearing. As we said, word recognition score, I, I can't overstate this enough, this is a big deal, indicates the integrity of the inner ear. As I say, we'll talk more about that later on. Sometimes the, the loudness of the test words can be too low, but that's pretty rare. So now let's talk something about hearing aids. They're a lot more complicated than most people realize. I mean, a lot more. Hearing aids are basically miniature public address systems. They have a microphone, they have an amplifier, they have a speaker, and they serve a wide variety of functions. It's not like a public address system that only serves one function. They are a real-time listening device. You can hear them, use them for telephones. You can use them for assistive devices, for workshops and, and, uh, and listening to worship and auditoriums and so on. They have a lot of different functions. And they function in a wide variety of situations, unlike virtually any other device. Up close, at various distances, sometimes out to 15, 20 feet with one person at a time, with a group of people, with a large group of people. And they function in quiet, in noise, at sporting events. And then the opposite end is performances, music, plays. You know, Shakespeare is kind of tough though. <laughs> I got to admit, even with a hearing aid, that's kind of hard to follow. That's because the redundancy is different than what we're used to with speech. And the other thing about hearing aids that users and, and new people have to keep in mind is that hearing aids don't have the advantage of microphone placement. They're always, always right here on your ear. Whereas anything else you listen to, the microphone's where? On the lapel or it's on a boom mic or an overhead mic. So the speaker is not very far separated from the microphone. Hearing aids, we're picking up sounds 20 feet away, 15 feet away. And of course, you're always gonna get the loudest sound the best or the closest one the best. And hearing aids almost always work in the presence of noise of some sort. Household noise, outside noise, you're in the store, what have you. There's always some kind of noise going on. And they, as I said, they work at a wide variety of, of, of situations, weddings, restaurants, workshops, infinitely wide variety of acoustic environments and events. So they do a lot more work than people realize. And they're very different from passive listening devices, the Walkman, the iPod, headsets, your TV listeners or other devices. They're all passive amplifiers. They never have to process the raw signal. It's already done for them. Everything they pass on is pre-recorded or is processed in a sound studio. And the microphones, as we said, are very close to the source of the sound or they're right at the mouth or on the lapel. Every single thing you hear over a headset has gone through an audio engineer, right? Everything. And so they've had a chance to manipulate the signal and adjust it and modify it for optimum hearing and bring every participant up to the ideal listening level. There's a different channel for each person involved. And you've seen them all. 
there's just been a huge array of controls and dials and knobs uh, for each channel. Then they all go to this marvelous mixer that's not inhibited or not affected by a small power source. They're getting their power from the wall, you know, what, 220 volts sometimes probably. And so it's a whole different situation than what your hearing aid's doing and doing all that work on a volt and a half, not even. Um, and, and everything you hear over your headset is done in a perfectly controlled acoustic environment. There is no noise. They don't let it happen. You know, you've all seen sound studios, right? Quiet on the set. They don't let the sound happen. Hearing aids make sounds louder, and we all know that. And this is where the cost comes in. It is not expensive to make sounds louder. It's very inexpensive. We did that in graduate school, simple RC circuit that we put together with a speaker somewhere, you know, a little transistor maybe in the middle. So it got louder, um, but that it, it's not hard. <clears throat> Where the expense comes in, excuse me, is in controlling the loudness output to provide a comfortable listening level for the person who's using it. That's not, I'm gonna say, repeat it, not inexpensive. These things expand soft sounds, they compress the louder sounds so they're not exceeding the limit of uncomfortable level. So they're bending that sound, they make it loud quickly, then they start knocking it over. They do that in nine different points lots of times for each of the 20 or 12 or 24 channels of that hearing aid. That's a whole lot different than these passive devices that you're, that we all compare hearing aids to. And there's noise reduction circuitry and features in there. It includes, without getting into detail, phase reversals, binaural interactions, other signal and noise algorithms. They can identify noise from speech and modify it all the time. Do they do it great? They do it a lot better than they used to, but of course they can't capture it all. And this is all squeezed in to the user's dynamic range. That means the softest sound they can hear and the loudest sound they can tolerate. Surprisingly, Lots of hearing loss, there's a decrease in the ability to tolerate loud sound. So they're doing it all within that narrow range. And the kicker is they're doing it in real time and without the benefit of an audio engineer to help us. They use directional microphones. As I said, they have other noise reduction features. The directional microphone is neat because that means that if you're looking straight ahead, it's gonna reduce everything else around not by a lot, 3 dB, 5 dB, 4 dB. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it improves the signal to noise ratio enough so that the signal that you wanna hear is somewhat louder than the noise that's around you when it can do that. And they even know if there's sound coming off here to the right or the left that you might be interested in. And they're gonna focus on that for you, turning everything else down. They have multi-programs for speech and quiet, for speech and background noise, for music, for uh, assistive devices. You know, there's up to six programs. And now your, your, your hearing aids can hook up to TV, smartphones, remote microphones. Eric knows a lot about this stuff and does Lauren. Using Bluetooth and other technology. They're so much more complex than earphones or iPods or any other your level listening device you might come across. There's some circuit features we don't know about maybe. Expansion we've talked about, compression we've talked about, multi-channels, noise management, inter-oral communication. If there's something going on, noise on this side, it'll turn it down and it'll turn this side if this is where the signal is. And you don't think of it, but nowadays most of them are kind of open ear. They're not plugging up the ear like we used to. And they have feedback su 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 suppression circuits, which means that in the old days, you all know about hearing aids that used to whistle and squeal a lot. Well, they don't do that very much. Now, some power hearing aids, that may still be a problem, but it's not like it was. And they do a whole lot more things too. So I'm, I, this is some, 
the material I picked up and just looking at one of the manufacturers um, uh, uh, a provider page online. Of course, they all have self-contained power supply. And even after all these years, the manufacturers still tout that. That's what a big deal that is. And these guys are doing a lot of work. They are processing. I can't comprehend this. I don't know what to do with it. I can't use it. I can't evaluate it. I have to take their word for it. 56,000 times per second. Can you imagine? That's a lot of processing. Now, it takes and it divides the signal or the incoming material into two parts. The part you want to keep and the part you want to reject. Somehow it determines which is which and passes on the part you want to keep. And it's monitoring your environment around your head 100 times per second to determine, is there anything over here of interest that my listener needs to pay attention to? It's just amazing. And they're constantly rebalancing the auditory input of the individual sounds. And it will switch attention between the various acoustic sounds in the, env in the environment, excuse me. They have extremely fast noise reduction algorithms. Actually can remove background noise between the syllables of a word or even between words. It's just fantastic. Now, I have an asterisk there because older auditory systems, mine included, have a little bit harder time, sometimes a lot harder time taking advantage of all of these things. And we'll see some of the reasons for that later on in, in, in one of the other sessions. So it, we find sometimes that the best thing to do is to back off of some of these uh, fast acting algorithms uh, for older individuals such as me. So now let's talk about some key things you need to know about getting hearing aids. We've said this a hundred times now, probably nothing harder to buy, no brand recognition. The idea that they don't work, but there's a lot of places to get hearing aids from, isn't there? Mail order or online, the discount big box stores or franchises, commercial dispensers or professional meaning audiologist dispensers. Um, what's the difference? And there's a bias here. There's always the cost, the idea they don't work, and they're not worth it. They're just too big of a markup. Well, I found out that's hard to defeat. Um, they say, you know, if you read consumers reports or, or AARP, negotiate the best price. No, we don't have, a, we didn't have a store. We had a professional practice. I don't negotiate with my dentist over the cost of my fillings or my crowns. I don't neg negotiate with my physician. Um, I just, he tells me how much it is and that's what it is. And I always had the approach that if somebody came in who was good at marketing and knew how to negotiate, they had an advantage over somebody who doesn't. And most of the time people who know how to do this don't need it. And those who don't know know how to do it need it the most. So no, we never had any negotiations. Uh, and then there's the, the idea of the holy grail. If you pay a lot, you're going to get a fine instrument and all your problems are going to be solved. Well, that's not really the case. You're going to find out later on the most important component is not the device. But it's where you get it from. And actually, it's coming up right now. So when somebody gets a hearing aid, they're not buying a device or the latest technology. Instead, you're entering, you're going to ideally enter into a long-term relationship with a provider, possibly for the rest of your life, 10, 20, 30 years. Um, there are disadvantages to the big box stores or these franchise brands or these things you see on TV advertised. Their software is proprietary. You can't take it anywhere else to get it worked on. You have to go back to that place. And if you're not happy with that hearing aid or if you don't like the provider, you're stuck. There's no place else you can go. If you're traveling, your hands are tied. You have to work within that, uh, th that franchise 
or that company. That's a really big deal. And that's very handicapping for people. And keep in mind, most of the providers are, are sales oriented people. They're board certified hearing instrument specialists. And I don't believe that most such individuals start out wanting to be a hearing aid specialist. They start out in some other field and kind of back into the hearing aid work. Um, and they may be transient. Now, there are some you know, some situations where, where audiologists are employed, where staff is transient. And I think it's kind of hard, it's important to find out where these places are and just be aware of it. The most important component of getting hearing aids, as we've said, is the provider. And you never, here's a good rule of thumb, never follow up on a splashy ad, with all these big, these features and this and that. This is gonna solve your problems and you got 50% off today and all of this stuff. That's not true. It's never 50% off. That's the normal price. That's the manufacturer's suggested retail price is very high. And that's a price that nobody ever charges and nobody ever pays, ignore that. Do not be taken in by 50% discounts. Never go see the national expert who's available for only three days. That person comes in, they sell you something, they sound great, knowledgeable, but you never see them again. And they walk away with a very high percentage of the overall sales price. There is no hearing aid breakthroughs. They don't exist. They're not, they, but every change, every, every improvement is incremental. It's very small built on what everybody else has done. And not only that, uh, when a company comes up with a great idea, they keep it for a year, maybe two, then they start selling off the patent on those devices to the other companies. And before long, it spreads pretty broadly. Um, so getting back to the provider, it's knowing what to do with a technology that counts. It's not the bells and whistles. It's not the number of channels. It's none of that hype. It's knowing how to handle it. So never be persuaded by the latest technology or this special feature or the various buzzwords. What you wanna do is seek the most qualified provider. Way to do that is hard. You ask around, you go online, you look for reviews and this kind of thing. Don't follow the ads. So some rules of thumb, try to avoid tiny hearing aids or trying to hide it. If you do, you're gonna lose features and options. And nowadays they're so small, who knows them? Who sees them anyways and who cares? I mean, I've got mine on. It's a small little thing. This is a behind the ear. This is where the hearing aid mechanics are or the electronics. This is where the sound comes out. This part here is a tiny little amplifier, actually. So the sound comes out of here, goes down this wire into this receiver part where it's amplified a little bit and uh, then it's sent to the ear canal. Now, these are hard to put in. So if you have a problem with manual dexterity, by all means, then you want an in the ear type because they are easier to manage. Um, When you're buying a hearing aid, you want three things. You want a volume control, and you actually want a separate volume control. You don't want one that's one of your programs. You want to be able to turn your hearing aids up and down. You want a telephone coil for use on the phone, which is not as important as it used to be, but perhaps your smartphone and the induction loops that abound in our community and you want multiple programs so that you can switch from everyday hearing to noise background to music and what have you. Um, I found in my practice that mid-grade worked best for most hearing losses, especially those ideal ones, those, those moderate ones that are gradually sloping or so with good word recognition. We found that the low end, we did a lot of long-term follow-up. 
we found that the low end rarely worked out well. People weren't happy with them. They were in the beginning because they're hearing better than they were. But after the honeymoon period is over, which is about four months, then they began to notice all of the, the, the negatives. So that almost never worked out well in the long run. Uh, extremely complex hearing losses or demanding listening situations or someone's got a major tolerance problem, then I think you do want to look towards the higher end. Now, the costs we're talking about are 1800 or 1600 for low end and maybe 2000, 2200 for mid grade. This is for one and 3000 to 3100 for uh, the high end. Um, two hearing aids are best. And how do we know that? Here's a great slide coming up here. This is the advantages of binaural, that, that means two hearing aids versus one. You see over here on the right, these black circles represent normal hearing and of, uh, the function of normal, of normal hearing. And I don't know if I can bring this up, I don't think so. Uh, down here is a percentage of intelligibility. So you've got 0% to 100%. And of course, when you get into the more noisy situations, intelligibility increases. But look at the two ears, that's binaural hearing aids. They, they're, they get pretty close to normal, don't they? I don't think in reality they get this close, but this is what this data shows. And look at the difference with monaural. So if you are, that's one hearing aid. If you are at home and quiet most of the time, probably you can get by with one hearing aid. I still would get at least the moderate level of technology because it's a softer, more comfortable sound. So in terms of getting hearing aids, you wanna make sure that you see the most qualified provider. You want to know what your hearing loss is like. You want to know the configuration and you want a word recognition score. Make sure you get one of those. Make sure that testing is done. Uh, lots of times commercial sectors don't do word recognition score and they rely only on the pure tone audiogram that we showed you and the configuration and the degree. And that, that can really miss a very important piece of information for some users. Um, especially if you're really frustrated and you go to one of these places and they don't do word recognition, you don't want to buy a hearing aid from them. I guarantee you. Make sure you get a copy of the audiogram before you leave the office. It's the law. It's yours. You're entitled to it, whether you paid for it or not. And as I said, I can't stress it enough. Make sure you have the word recognition test completed. If you're a veteran, know that you might be eligible for services through the VA. So in summary, today we covered general information about hearing loss, a brief review of the audiogram, a little bit about hearing aids, some introduction on some of the things you need to know about getting hearing aids. Now on Monday, we're going to cover other critical aspects you need to know about getting hearing aids, with some good information about the various providers that are out there. And I think you should really uh, I try to catch that session if you can, because hopefully it'll be pretty interesting for you. So at this point, we can stop now and we can take questions. And I'm going to shut down the, the, uh, the presentation so I can see everybody's screen now.